Welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming to the circle. That's the way Indigenous people generally have their events because they, we can, everybody can see everybody. You don't have to be in somebody's behind somebody's head if, if possible. Um, my name is Roberto. I've been in the movement since 1969 with the occupation of Alcatraz Island in San Francisco. And I've been in different movements, and like uh, my friend who talked about being the part, Panther Party, I also studied the Little Red Book in, in Oakland where the Black Panthers had their political education. But like a lot of people here, I, the older of us especially, we were all Marxist-Leninists. I was a Maoist. I'm an organic intellectual. I never got my degree, uh, but through no fault of my own. I wanted to be a PhD professor, but I owed money to a university, and they would not let me back in unless I paid the whole amount, which I couldn't. So I went back to being a carpenter, ended up being homeless. But I worked with the Boggs from the 80s, and that was a tremendous experience for me. I learned so much from Jimmy and Grace by their thoughts and by their actions and their example. They were sort of like my second parents, so to speak. Anyway, we, we, we elders especially have evolved from Marxist-Leninism to a large extent. Not everybody, but most of us in the movement realize that we're in post-Marxist period and that our ideas have evolved from the way that Marx put out his philosophy and a lot of other groups. And um, what got me started on what, on what I'm doing now is a lot of things. But one thing that really stood out is that I was reading a, a, the speech from Martin Luther King called Beyond Vietnam. And he said, among other things, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. And I t said, where are those values? Where's an explanation of where they are? I couldn't really find except bits and pieces. You know, but I thought, I, I realized our movement needed to become clearer about values. Because values, I learned, were like the foundation of a house. They're the foundation of a movement. If they're not clear, there's confusion, there's divisions, there's burnout. All these I've experienced in different movements. So I realized that we need to go deeper in talking about values. Uh, we, we, a lot of us here are familiar with the, the uh, memes of revolutionary movements like bourgeois, uh, proletariat, and uh, all of those other terms, which are most not completely out of date, but at least they need to be explained in more with more clarity. And as a native person, I was looking around for what are the values that we need and what are the values that we got to get rid of. And it came clear right away that we need to get rid of capitalist values right away. But what are they? A lot of people don't know what, they're not aware specifically of capitalist values as a whole. And as a result, we were all raised under capitalism, including myself. You know, I was not born knowing about indigenous values. I had to learn myself because my family was Christianized and uh, basically lost their culture and their values and their language. My mother lost her language. So I, I began to say, well, uh, maybe I have to find those out myself, which I tried the best I could. I came up with these uh, sets of values because I wanted to make sure that people knew what capitalist values were, but they also had to know what the alternative was. And it was sort of like a dialectic. When I made the chart, on either side of, of one side was uh, indigenous values, the other side was capitalist values. I looked at them, and they were like dialect, dum, they were dialectically opposed to each other. Let's put it that way. And they were almost the opposite of each one. So that was a dialectical thing that I realized that had happened. But being in the movement for a, a long time. And seeing all of the mistakes and divisions and hurts and things that were getting away in our movement, I, I realized that you know we're at the we're at the kind of toddler stage of this new movement around the world. And Zapatistas and Rojava, of course, are part of that, and we learn from them. But we have to make our ideas indigenous to this country, so that everybody here at one time their people were indigenous, even. European Americans who thought they, didn't, they weren't indigenous, 
they were indigenous to Europe before the Roman Empire came and Christianity came and colonized them. But you can reclaim those old valleys. Indigenous valleys around the world are basically earth-centered. We don't have sky gods. That's hierarchy. So we have to come back to this earth-centered type of values. And as I started writing these values down, I realized every one of them is kind of like part of a whole. It's a holistic vision of these values. They're all connected. You can't have one without the others. And another thing I realized, one individual, even if they read this and really understood it, cannot really change to those new values unless they study them with a group. Because we're trying to get away from individualistic thinking, which means that we have to learn about these values in a group and then pass them on to ordinary people. Because there's a saying that I heard from the RC community, most people do the best they can with the information they have at the time. And our responsibility is to give them new information during this particular period if we're going to make this revolution work well. Because so many of the, so many of the problems of our movements have to do with being, having our values unclear. Because we all raised, as I said, under capitalism, and we still carry those values unconsciously. You know, so we have to make those values conscious in order to get rid of them. We have to decolonize our thinking because our values are, like I said, the foundation of a house and the foundation of a movement. You know, if those aren't clear, then the movement will stumble and eventually many times fall apart, which I've seen so many times, even now. So, uh, I, as I've been, ex been influenced by Murray Bookchin, by the Zapatistas, by Rojava, by the symbiosis movement here in, in the United States, which a lot of people don't even know about yet, but we're part of it. And the, I, in the Institute for Social Ecology, thinking is also a part of this. They're all inter interconnected. And people have been talking about, they, un they understand things like dialectical thinking. They understand about the movement in general, but we need to understand more specifically values and this is why I did this work because like I say if we don't understand these clearly enough we're going to continue to make mistakes and have divisions so and I realized as I did this that communalist values as described by Murray Bookchin and also in a wonderful article by Eleanor Communalist values are basically the same as indigenous values. That's why I have indigenous communalist values. It's, it's, sort of, it's sort of like I take from indigenous thinking and actions, but I update it to the, this period in history. It's sort of like when uh, people started talking about in, uh, restorative justice, they realized that it worked well before colonialism, but it has to be updated during the colonial period, and it's called transformative justice. So that's the kind of like what we need to do with these values. You know, they come from indigenous ways of living, which did not produce, you know, climate change or industrialization and all that crap of capitalism. But uh, anyway, I think I'm going to pass it on to Eleanor, and she's going to talk more about the communalist aspect of these values. Thanks so much. Um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you. I'm kind of amazed that I'm, I'm sitting here right now. And um, I have so much to say, but I want to keep my comments brief because um, I think we're really here to start a dialogue. Uh, as Roberto said, like our movement is really nascent. We're just starting um, in so many ways, you know, and um, in this particular part of the world, in you know, at the center of empire, we're we're just getting started. But also as a species, in many ways, we're really coming to understand ourselves, um, in some ways, for the first time. And um, so, I want I want all of us to be a part of this um, as equals. But I would like to say a little bit about how. Um, I came to be to be up here with Roberto, um, which is also just really truly um, an honor, and um, and how I kind of came to this perspective in my work. Um, I'm one of those like educationally privileged middle class kids. Went and studied philosophy. Uh, we did not study dialectics in my department uh, because dialectics is dangerous. 
Um, and actually on the last session, I just want to offer to anybody who's kind of like struggling through that or is still on this question of like, why does this matter? I just want to offer like dialectics is the study of change. That's why they don't want us to know it. And it takes time and it takes hard work uh, to come to understand it, but it's worth it. Um, so that's why you have, you know, folks who started out working in foundries and auto factories who start to understand dialectics and say, this is, this is what we need. Um, so, you know, I come from that perspective. And then um, as a young person in my early 20s, I came across Murray Bookchin's work and the Institute for Social Ecology. And it blew me away. It completely revolutionized my thinking. And this was right before the Occupy movement. And um, I'd never heard anyone put forward an alternative to the status quo um, that was also so forward-thinking as M Murray Bookchin's proposal for federated direct democracy, right? Like, you, you know, there was sort of the status quo. Then there was anarchism, which I was really interested in at the time, but it seemed quite vague. And then obviously you have, you know, communism or authoritarian socialism in various iterations. I don't think that all forms of, um, of, of communism are authoritarian, but again, there was sort of an underdeveloped aspect to what a non-hierarchical, horizontal, truly participatory way of life looks like. Um, so when I came across social ecology and started to better understand direct democracy, um, it really blew me away, and I just dove right into it. I was like, I want to know everything about this. Um, I want to be a part of making it happen. And then Occupy happened, and I was really involved in that movement and all of its, um, and all of its beauty and all of its contradictions. And, um, and then through, through that uh, experience, also, you know, I guess a question I want to, uh, to raise here and be a part of answering with you all is, what is real democracy, right? And that's a very fraught word. I, you know, I, I understand that even that word democracy for a lot of people is like, that means one thing and that means that's propaganda, that's hegemony that's coming from the top down and saying, we're gonna bring you democracy, you know, at the barrel of a gun if we have to. Um, but I think that there, there is something to it and um, social ecology helped me understand that, that there's, there's really two legacies of that word. And, um, and on the liberatory legacy, we as human beings have a very long and rich history of direct democracy, of self-governance. And um, as I continued my journey through this movement, um, coming from social ecology, which is very embedded in the Western philosophical tradition. And if you, you know, you read Murray's work, like a lot of the examples that he's most interested in, they're, you know, they're from Western Europe or they're from, you know, what we call North America today. And, um, and that was, you know, that was my orientation. It, you know, it was where it was coming from. That was my learning journey. But as I continued in this movement longer, I started to understand that actually the real wealth of knowledge and understanding about how to be democratic is coming from indigenous people and indigenous communities. And even that word indigenous, you know, what, what, does, that, what does that mean? Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not the best person to answer that. A lot of other folks here in this room are gonna be uh, much better equipped to, to answer it, but, um, but it became clear to me that the legacy of direct, you know, what we we're calling direct democracy at the Institute for Social Ecology, right? What we are calling the legacy of direct democracy, the legacy of freedom, has many, many iterations. And it goes by many vocabularies. And it has many, there are many different ways of understanding it. And um, it has to do with people who are labeled backwards, who are labeled primitive, Right, who are um, who are seen as somehow inhabiting the past, and that civilization is going to bring you know going to bring them forward, and um, you know, and part of that narrative is the idea that uh, 
you know, it would be really great if we could all be horizontal, if we could all be like hunter gatherers, right? You know, that sounds nice. The, the noble savage, the, the idyllic human past, it would be great if we could have that, but you can't have civilization and you can't have technology and you can't have nice things and you can't have a globalized society and have real grassroots democracy. And, um, and as I moved through my learning journey, I understood that um, that is absolutely not the case. And that indigenous movements around the world are our future. Um, the, the indigenous, our indigenous legacy that is a, that's a global legacy, it's not the past, it's our future. And, um, and that's what we're sort of moving, um, that's what we're wanting to move towards. Again, there's, there's so much to talk about. I don't know how we're doing on time. Um, but I, I'd like to maybe make just a, f a few points before moving on. And, and one is that the relationship between social ecology and what Bookchin calls organic society is something that goes back for a, a long time. I think a lot of folks get into Bookchin's work and they sort of pick up on the federated direct democracy piece and they go, oh, that's really great. You know, and they kind of try to pluck it out of its context. And if you read this very cumbersome and intimidating looking book, but it's actually really beautiful, it's called The Ecology of Freedom, Mason might have talked about it last night. Really what you're seeing in here is a, is a value system and, and a way of life. And, um, and you can't just pluck the procedures and the institutions out of the value system. And um, these are some of the conversations that Roberto and I have been having over the last year, you know, as we were talking about our movement, the way this movement is growing, the problems that we're seeing emerging from the, the movement work is that we're seeing that the values are getting lost and the rootedness in a deeper, um, you know, as Roberto put it, the foundation of a house. I, it's a little cheesy, but I, I do like to think of it as the soil, like, you know, that's, that's the ground that we, that we stand on. And, and you can't get anything out of, you, can, you know, you can, you can have the best seeds, but if you don't have the right soil, it's, it's not going to grow. Um, so this question of what is real democracy, it involves values. Um, you know, it also involves procedures and institutions. Um, but like, you know, but like Roberto, and I think a lot, of, a lot of folks who've been doing this movement work for a while have come to an understanding that we have to reconnect with our values. Um, so that's sort of what, what came into um, us wanting to talk about this with you all today. And sure, yeah. Yeah, when I talk about indigenous, uh, the word indigenous means that you, your people are from a certain area in the in the world, and uh, you still retain a lot of the values of that period before colonization, before capitalism. And what the, my goal in spreading this information is to have everyone here become indigenized to this country, to this land, not this country, but to this land. And when she talked about uh, this is the future, it's going to be hard because. The, the capitalist system is going to collapse. It is collapsing. And what we are offering is actually de what they call degrowth because the, the, the constant growth of capitalism is not sustainable. And it, it leads to destruction of the earth and people and animals. So we really have to rethink you know, how we live with these values. Like, and sometimes Native people talk about land back, but as a Native person myself, I realize, you know, we don't want land back if it involves private property. Exactly. We would like to free the land and have it as a commons, as it was before colonization and capitalism came and created private property, which one is their sacred values, of course. But uh, we, didn't, we didn't have that, so we shared the land with everybody that was there. Sometimes there was conflict and we have to re learn how to better re resolve uh, situations of conflict over land and resources. 
but it, it's doable. But we have, to, we, have to, we have to learn these values as a whole, as an organic whole, and that it evolves. These are just the beginning of this new think, way of thinking about values. Every, every one of you can add to it. I learned something from RC, Revaluation Community also, is that every document they write is always, uh, it's, not per, it's not permanent. It's always open to change. It has to be, because things change all the time. Change is part of the nature of living. And if you don't adapt to this change, we become irrelevant or we, we die. So this is what this new movement is trying to do, is to, become, is to adapt to this 20, 21st century change of the collapse of the capitalist system and trying to find a better way to live. And the, this is what I'm trying to do here, is to make sure that you know the differences between these sets of values. Because if you don't, you're going to get confused. And you're going to have to go through a process of decolonizing from all of these values. You can't do it by yourself. I mean, you can read it, but you have to do it as a group. And what she and I would like to do eventually is to develop this into a workshop, you know, with new ideas from people and take it around the country because we need that. That's the foundation of a movement. And if we're not clear on that foundation, we're going to continue to make mistakes because we'll still carry some of these unconscious capitalist values, egotism, individualism, you know, you name it, sectarianism, you know, crack line, all that stuff. So anyway, what we're trying to do is just the beginning of a deeper way of thinking. Because when he, Martin Luther King said, a radical revolution of values, radical is very important. Radical, mean, radical means go to the root. And we're going to the root of our new movement, which is the values. So, but everyone can learn these, and everyone can take them back to their families, to their groups, to their movements, and, just, and talk about, dialogue about these, and have people, you know, Point them out, if, you captured, if you're having capitalist values and exhibiting them by your actions, people need to say, you know, there's a better way. We don't try, we don't want to cancel them. We can't, we can't cancel cultures are not part of what we're at, about. But we want to change people in a positive way. And I think the people in Rojava have a word for that. What is it called? Tech, tech mill or something? Mm, techno. Yeah, that, that way of looking at, you know, changing our values is something that we need to do, adapt, you know a positive way of helping each other change to do these better values and getting rid of and, and, and uh, recognizing the capitalist values that we still carry. And which sometimes we can't recognize that unless somebody points it out to us in a good way, not in a bad way, not in a council culture way or put down way. So that's, that's what we're about. Nice. So, um I just have a, a, f a few more things to say, and then I think we can transition into um, to a discussion. We don't have a specific plan for facilitation, so I'm hoping we can kind of like help each other out with things like that. Like you see somebody with their hand up and we don't see them, you know, um, we'll work together. Um, so there's there's so much to add here and i actually you know in my own notes i had you know some other values to add um but i really want to flag one which i think is really crucial and kind of grounds um this the ethos of this workshop and also i think in many ways this program um and that's the a principle of unity and diversity and that, for Bookshin, again, if you read this book, it comes up again and again. It's this, in, it, it comes up in nature, right? That w we achieve balance and, um, and stability and growth in a, in a unity and diversity. And I think the direction of this movement is towards a unity and diversity, towards plurality. You know, obviously the Zapatistas call it one world where many worlds fit. Um, and that doesn't mean that there is an integrity to that one world. It doesn't mean just everything goes. It means that they're aligned along values. And if you go to, if you go to Rojava, if you talk to Kurdish freedom activists, they'll tell you um, that they're striving to make what they call a democratic society, right? Um, or a democratic civilization. What they, what they mean by that very concretely and specifically is that they want room for all of the various 
cultures, worldviews, religious perspectives that are indigenous to the Middle East to have representation there. And um, Abdullah Ojalan and his writings will talk about society as a flower garden. There are many, many different kinds of flowers um, that, that constitute the, the garden. And this principle of, of unity and diversity, I think, is really critical as we move forward as a movement to know that we're not always going to use the same words for things. We're not always going to emphasize the same principles. But really at bedrock, you know, like Roberto said, these values have a synergy to them. Um, they support each other. You can't just pluck one out. Um, that this is the basis that we're coming from, and that's what it, that's what it means to have a truly democratic movement um, at scale. And um, I want to sort of put that forward as a, as a provocation for, for all of us, because I think we all have that, you know, that little internal colonist who says, like, oh, I want people to see things the way I see things. You know, I want them to use the language that I use. Um, and we're all sort of in a process of, of working with that and combating with that. Um, and yeah, so I, I think now might be a really wonderful time to, to hear from, from everybody here. Um, first hand I saw was over here, and I think, okay. Um, if you don't mind, I think you also had your hand up for the last session um, with the braids. Yeah, yeah. As y'all were talking, I was just kind of like thinking about um, ways in which this nation has attacked institutions that hold values. You know, like for for instance, I think about from the south. I'm from the south, and although I grew up Christian, I also grew up in the black church, and I thought that the black church was um, an institution that held a lot of um, values, especially. Um, very West African indigenous values, like around hoodoo, communalism, all that stuff. The church was an institution where mutual aid came, like mutual aid came out of the black church, which is why it was such a um, deliberate attack on the black church as an institution by like far right insurrectionists in the 60s. And so I'm thinking about like that deliberate attack, like what are some examples that capitalist values right now are attacking our institutions of value? And the first, another example that comes to my mind is like, how we organize relationally. Like the nuclear family to me is a capitalist value. It's not an indigenous and communist, communalist values because you know, it upholds this hierarchy of adult over child, you know, ageism, where, ch where children don't get to have a voice or autonomy. And so, yeah, I guess my question is, um, you know, growing up indigenous Creek, this is to you, you know, what are some, uh, you know, you talked about your, the language your mother's language being taken away. And I see that also as a way, a tool of passing down values. Like it's also an institutional um, tool, like language um, as a like communal institution also holds values. But yeah, like what are ways that y'all see, y'all are seeing maybe in the past or the present um, ways that like capitalist values or this state is like attacking you know, those institutions. And I, I wish I had a better word because institutions sound so capitalist. <laughs> but yeah, um, ways that um, this state are attacking institutions of values that are more indigenous or communalist. Um, actually, I think before we, we have answers, and again, I, I kind of want to invite folks here also to answer these, these questions with each other. Um, I, I know we have one more comment, and I. I have a feeling it's going to be a good one. Hi, good morning. My name's Alicia. I'm from the Bronx, and my family um, comes from the Caribbean. So these are just more comments um, for thought, and it's open for everyone, so thank you for that. Um, it seems to me that a lot of social ecology is for people who have lost their earth-based practices, and it's very it's rationalizing what is spiritually understood, but not exactly known, right? Because it's not meant to be known. It's meant to be an open process. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, as I'm observing and listening, I think that's of great value because many of us have lost our earth-based practices for a variety of different reasons, whether that's through imposed monotheistic religions, whether that's through colonialism, settled colonialism, et cetera. I'm speaking to the choir. Number two, I think that the word democracy in itself needs to be reconsidered. It is a word from the Greeks. It is polis, P 
P-O-L-I-S, right? P-O-L-I-S, um, and it's for humans. So it did not entail our consideration of our more than human kin in our relationships. So we also have to reconsider that word. That's all, thank you. I think this might be more of a comment than a question, if that's okay. In the last session on dialectics, we were talking a lot about how when you organize, there's more, there's new contradictions that arise, new contradictions that arise. And just wanted to give a shout out to the Zapatistas uh, thinking on this. They have a book that's been published from a seminar called Critical Thought in the Face of the Capitalist Hydra. They talk about capitalism as a hydra from Hercules' labors, diff lots of different heads keep growing, you cut off one head, another one grows. So then the question becomes for us, how do we actually kill the beast? Because when we keep chopping off one face, it's very good at creating another one that matches our desires. We can talk about a black president of empire, right, as one of those faces, an indigenous president, women, Hillary Clinton, for example. We can talk about China as a new face with this great optimism that it's different from the United States. Well, the United States was different from the, from the, the British Empire as well. There was optimism back then. So this, this question of values, I think, is really central in figuring out how to kill the beast. Because if those values continue as we're trying to resist and we, and, and we end up installing new faces, it makes it a lot more difficult for us to continue struggling because it's a way to neutralize us. The Zapatistas don't give us an answer of what they believe is the solution. They ask us all to, to be critical thinkers in our own geographies and share with the world, with them, with each other, of what the new faces are where we exist because so much is contextual. But what we can do in sharing our experiences is come together and try to figure out a theory for what's going on. This is exactly what theory is. It's trying to understand phenomena that keeps repeating in a pattern, right? So just wanted to give a shout out uh, to that. Uh, the book is published by, in English, the translation, AK Press is, well, it's published by Paper Boat Press, distributed by AK Press, Critical Thought in the Face of the Capitalist Hydra. It all exists for free as well on the Zapatista's website in translations uh, into a bunch of different languages too. So very, very grateful for this conversation because I think that, yeah, that's, we need to get to the root of, of this system so that we don't replicate it, get co-opted in it. And also just shout out to what Eleanor was talking about, this question of difference. I wonder if we might think about that too as indigenous communalist values versus capitalist values in that capitalist values are incredibly, uh, they homogenize us. Even though it has space for multicultural, blah, 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 whatever that fuck shit is, they, it does not respect difference. Difference is annihilated or co-opted, but for its own values. The respective difference is precisely a world where many worlds fit, and that that's the big challenge that we have, and I think that this is a, a really important way forward to that. Thank you, Kiki. I really loved her point about difference. It kind of touches on um, my comment, and I'd love to hear any if anyone has reactions. Um, there are certain values, uh, by, by the way, my name is Casimiro. Hi, everybody. Um, there are certain values that I feel have been possessed or taken hostage by capitalist, the capitalist system and capitalist institutions. You know, some, well, there's the word individualism. Another word you could say is self-determination. Um, innovation is often, air quotes, taken as like a capitalist value. Competition is often seen as a capitalist value. But we also know that like innovation definitely occurs in, within indigenous communities and it is something that doesn't inherently belong to the capitalist system. Um, same as difference. Difference is something that is used to exploit, marginalize, disenfranchise, and divide our communities to hoard power. But difference is something that should be celebrated and, and upheld. 
So I guess I'm holding those contradictions and trying to suss out like, what are the filters and the an analysis um, that we need to have in place so that the certain values that are also capacities that we need to build on our own can be integrated into the, into the capital M movement. So when we think about self-determination, innovation, technology, how are we uh, making sure that those capacities and values that don't just belong to that system are also integrated into our own, but without it al allowing that to mutate us into the very thing we are opposing? Thank you. Yeah, this is so exciting. I'm so glad to be having this conversation. Um, Roberto, you had... You had a response, and then I actually have a response to, to something Cassie Mito said. Yeah. I can't remember what, the, what it was that I was going to respond to. Did you remind me? How capitalism is attacking. Oh, values, indigenous values. And she's also asking about what it was like growing up with indigenous values. Well, I actually wasn't, I didn't grow up with a lot of indigenous values. I had some, of course, you know, like we had um, the tradition of, we, when we go to church, we'd all share the food and uh, help each other as best we could. Like we didn't have a car, so maybe we had to call on our friends and neighbors and relatives to, to travel around. So those kept, though, we kept those because they were necessary. But our, our people, like my mother and my stepfather are both, fundamentalist Christians. And I remember talking to my mother about uh, chiefs, you know, that there was a woman running and she said, women shouldn't be chiefs. And I said, what? And I realized later, you know, that's the patriarchy, which is in, ingrained into most of the Abrahamic religions, you know, Muslims, Jewish, Christian, they were all very patriarchy. And the most, the most uh, fundamentalist aspects of all of those religions are heavy on patriarchy. You know, take the Taliban, obviously, ridiculously. But, uh, so, we, tr we wanna try to integrate people that coming from religious backgrounds, and the, the good news is that the, the, the trend is away from religions, all of them, and especially among young people, because they see the contradictions right away, you know, especially around patriarchy. So we, when we look at the Trumpers, we have to remember one thing ab about them, and this is also what I learned from the Revaluation Counseling Community, is that don't hate the person, hate the pattern, you know? That, because, because they're just ordinary people. They, they have the information they have from the right wing, and we have to give them new information, but we have to make, make it clear that we can't start saying they're all bad people, because they're not. They have bad ideas, bad principles, bad values, and we can deal with those on a separate level. Not, we don't, we don't cancel them as human beings. And that's a mistake that so many of us make. Uh, so that's one thing I learned you know, about how to deal with people like that. Uh, my own family doesn't like some of the work that I'm doing but I, I can't hate them. I just say, oh, that's the, what they learn from, you know, their, whatever they learn it from, you know. They, they, they're very much pro-war because one of them, my, my relatives was a veteran, Vietnam veteran. And I'm a veteran too, but I hate war. And I hated the Vietnam War. But anyway, um, there were some ideas that I had that I wanted to get out too. I'm trying to remember them. Uh, I just want to go back to the idea that we are a new movement, but we haven't cl uh, clarified our legs, which means our values. And as a result, we stumble a lot and we fall apart because our values are corrupted by capitalist values, which are still con unconsciously in our thinking. And we have to undergo that process of decolonizing our thinking together. We can't do it by ourselves, including myself. I try to live the best I can, but I still obviously have some, well, maybe not obviously, but I do know myself that I have some values that are coming from capitalism. But at least I can recognize it. That's the first step. And all of you need to look at this and see what kind of values 
you practice in your everyday life and in your movements and look for alternatives because there are alternatives to what you know to this the alternative to individualism is cooperation working together community and we have to think of about it as communities we have to stop using I so much and talk about we or us because that's what we are we're part of a community and we cannot really survive without each other and, and before colonization the, the worst punishment among our people was exile you know because you could die without a, a community to help you survive and it's the same thing principle is active today our movement will die unless we help each other unless we are part of a organic whole that has these values that's great um i actually when you know wanted to respond to um casimiro's point about like at what point do we start instigating a struggle over the values that capitalism claims for itself and how do we um yeah you know it and, and then at what point are we playing the fool a little bit? Because um, it's really not, not easy to tell, and we're going to make mistakes. Um, but that brought to mind something, you know, again, I'm, you know, this is me being a zealot, but like this book, man, just, it's, it's tough. Not everybody's going to like read it in the same way. I'm, I'm, hopefully there's going to be other sort of modalities for the ideas in this book, you know, like more visual stuff, more audio stuff. But something he says in this book, um, you know, um, and, and looking at, um, at organic society deeply, um, is he brings up the idea of the individual as a function of the community, right? That actually indigenous communities have very strong um, support for the individual. There's, there's a, like actually the individual, there's strong individuation because there's a strong connection to the community, right? So there's that's a very, very different understanding of the individual. So like, do we let go of individualism? All right, well maybe we let go of individualism, but actually we wanna say like, well, there's more room for individuals in what we're doing. So when people are scared, you know, they hear the word communism, it's scary, and they think, you, you know, you're just gonna make everybody wear gray jumpsuits and we're all gonna be the same. You say, no, actually, we're we are looking out for the individual that there's more room here in and our model for the individual because the individual is a function of community solidarity where you have communal solidarity actually there's there's more room to grow and experiment um you know and, and he talks about that in this book and and the other thing i want to plug on this book a little bit um is that is, is just how unique it was to at this time this book was written in 19 it was published in 1981 which means he was writing it through the 1970s and just, just how rare it was as a leftist to be going, you know, to be sort of going back and, and saying like, wait a second, all right, where do we go awry, right? Like meaning the, the left, like why are we arriving at authoritarian socialism? And, you know, he said, okay, there's something up with how we're conceiving of capitalism. And that actually capitalism is a symptom of deeper rooted problems that, involve the state, that involve patriarchy, that involve colonization, that involve, you know, all of the, the isms of, of hierarchy. And then, so what's the antidote to hierarchy, you know? And then he started looking at non-hierarchical societies. Again, it's, there, it's, which is not to say that the, there's not plenty that you can critique in here, but the fact that he went back and sort of said, hey, like, what are the, you know, what are the values that we can pull out? What are the principles that we can pull out? Um, you know, and there, there's several more like, um, like against hierarchy, um, you know, in this book he talks about status and the idea that we can have models of leadership. You know, we can, we can, we can um, revere our elders and we can have, you know, we can have models of leadership that are not about coercion. And um, so yeah, I just sort of want to put that out there that there's, you know, that there really is so much more to explore and also to, re, to reclaim also the idea of technology, right? Like this, association dominant society has between like indigenous societies, they're technologically primitive, right? And we know that that's not the case and we have to make that evident to people. Um, also in how, you know, and how we engage with technology. Um, 
Oh, actually, on the on that question about um, you know, sort of you know, folks involved in the institute or involved in social ecology or disengaged from the earth, there's there in earth center practices. There's such a long history there of like the ISC having land and then losing that land or being involved in you know the 11th Street movement, Low East Side, and then like you know getting getting kicked off of land. So it's like this relationship to land is really uh, critical because they know that it's powerful too, right? And that's why Detroit looks the way that it does. That land is really um, is really critical. I'm sorry, but that's not what I said. Oh. That's not what I said. It's when you're referring to a Yeah, I am. The Do you... is for people who have lost an earth-based practice there. An earth-based practice involves a spiritual practice as well. And we lose that for a variety of reasons for multiple generations. Um, and your program to be a capitalist in this instance, because this is where we are in the Western Hemisphere in the United States, um, we lose feeling. Yes, it's through the land that we get back to that. It's epistemic. You start touching that land, you start feeling spirit. But we're not programmed, we're not trained, we're not have these spaces where we can talk about that experience of it's, it's your DNA, it's your genes, you know. My people are Maroons, the Samaranaj in the Caribbean. If you want to talk about how you become indigenous to a place, you look at the Caribbean. You look at the southern United States. So that's what I meant, and I say that with love. Um. I'm seeing some other hands go up. Um, there's Drew, and I can't quite read your name, but you're wearing a yellow shirt. Um, and other folks, like if if you got something to say, also raise you know raise your, your hands up high. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to build on that comment. Um, just heavy on my heart, oftentimes in in speaking to. Um, especially white folks. Um, so I'm Filipino, but this uh, looking at multiple ways of knowing, and I think when we look at capitalist values of there's a hierarchy which favors, you know, logic or even these, the, the words that were, the way that we're um, learning these materials. And, you know, we have our, 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 um, our felt senses and just di different ways of, of knowing. And when I think about how can we engage and um, develop our values, I'm concerned with how we can break through and, um, and you know, encourage or, or uh, help these multiple ways of knowledge uh, come back into the fore and I think, you know, this is, this is related to land, you know, this is related to being out in the, on the earth. I talk to a lot of, um, you know, so-called intellectuals who then, who like to intellectualize pain, and it's like, you're missing the point. And, and so that, you know, this weighs heavy on my heart, and I think about, um, you know, we're here in this format, you know, just when I think about indigen indigenous values, um, things like rituals, things that, that have been um, like rituals and ceremonies um, that have, that got called primitive um, or, that get, or that got called, you know, something like that. Um, and so I guess my question really is, or, or something that I've been wrestling with a lot is, you know, in these, as I, as I move through my daily life or as I come into contact with folks who like to intellectualize or start to favor this, this logical way of knowing, um, you know, what can we do? What are the strategies that we can do to get folks engaged with the land, engaged with um, their relationality between being an individual amidst a diversity of folks um and yeah i don't know i guess that's that's kind of that's what i'm what i'm thinking about but i think there's a lot of themes that are that are coming up here for me um wait, before you actually could you keep it short and then we'll 
Sure. Uh, he's talking about land and how it's important to what we're trying to do. Uh, I, I remember thinking about food sovereignty and the word sovereignty is a word from capitalism, right, basically, because it's hierarchy. And I was thinking a better substitute would be food autonomy. And I hope that people would adopt that instead of sovereignty. Because sovereign, sovereigns are our kings and queens and hierarchical society. Just wanted to add that. Um, I also was told that there were some folks sitting behind me who had their hands raised. So maybe you could do that. And then other folks. Yes. Um, I uh, come from New York and I do some organizing and activism. And I, I come across a lot of folks, especially in the environmental and um, ecological and, and the political and racial, all these, all these intersectional things that a lot of people organize around individually or separately. And um, there, I think that there's a lot of knowledge that's being shared today. Uh, I, I find it difficult to continually have to update my lexicon so I can talk to people in an informed way to, that impresses upon them that I know what I'm talking about. Because um, I do spend a lot of time with the land. I don't have any land. Um, which is another point that I want to make. I don't have any land, but I have some earth-based based practices. I work really hard to, to keep my hands in the dirt and to keep my mind based in, on the ground, not to get too sp sp spiraled up, which is one of the reasons I, I wanted to come here to try to learn these dialectics and these words, because there's a lot of people that I organize with that really love the earth, but they don't have a political stance, and they're easily co-opted to be towards that neo-fascist idea of like, oh, the earth is in peril and it's the earth, human's fault and we have to like depopulate or we have to take people off and preserve this land and not let certain people participate. So they're really awesome individuals with no political, no, no principles. They don't have their legs under them, as you were saying, Alberto. And it's really important for us to go back and educate. We also have to activate and organize. So there's so many different ways that we can plug in to these um, movements that we're already part of, um, even talking to people who are not don't even think they're part of a movement, but are, but don't understand the political nature of their work. I, I'm part of a, a couple community gardens, and a lot of people just don't want their garden to be politicized. And I have to tell them, look, we wouldn't have a garden if somebody didn't risk their freedom to secure this land for us to garden on. And they still just, oh, but I just want to come and relax and don't want to weigh in on the local political issues. And it's really important, and it's so frustrating time and time again to have to deal with people who, and, and not just white people, but mostly white people, um, who, who don't want to politicize their, their free time. Um, but realizing that we're constantly, that the person was political is important, and being able to ex express that in a way that's not derogatory, talking over or above people, in a very relatable way, is so important. So I think that uh, we, we're learning a lot and I'm very, very thankful for everything that's being said here today. And I'm writing down a lot and I'm gonna take it all with me, so thank you. Um, if folks who have their hands up, um, it's, it is actually, it is easier if you guys come up here, but, um, what's that? Oh yeah, I think um, you had your hand up for a long time and then also you had your hand. Um, yeah, I really appreciate a lot of the ideas that have been brought into this space. Um, going back to, what was your name? Drew. Drew. Going back to what Drew said about, like, uh, forms of knowledge beyond, like, straightforward logical reasoning, I really, I really connected with that. I feel like the vibe, I feel like the vibe was, um, like, uh, the role of intuition, like building intuition in how we think about this. I wanna add to that. Skills are not lot like, like, do, like democracy is a skill that we have to learn. We, you can be, you can have the values and you can have the logic and you can be bad at democracy in the same way that you can understand how hierarchies work and how, work, and how workplaces logically work, but be a bad manager. Um, like, and we all learn the skills, we all learn the skills of hierarchy in our schools, in our families, in our, often our churches, 
and definitely in our workplaces. So we have those skills, but we don't have the skills that it takes to, um, we, we, we need to build the skills that it takes to be democratic together. We have to, we have to identify that we are beginners and we have to learn how to do that. And I think the same thing is true of like building your earth-based practices, being able to, to look at a piece of land and like, and like understand it to a certain, and like understand it to a certain ex extent. That's a skill, you can't simply, like books can help, but you can't simply learn it from a book. Um, and so I think one thing that I, one thing that I would really like, one thing I would really like to gain from this week is I would like to build, I would like to have a chance to build some of those skills. And I'm not exactly sure if that is something that was, uh, that is in, in the facilitation, but, um, yeah, I just, I, that is something I want to, I want us to be open to. Cause I, like, like earlier, it was like, we learned a lot about dialectics, but I, I want to practice, I want to learn the skill of doing it, you know? So that's sort of, uh, that's sort of my vibe. Also love the fidget toys. Yes. Uh, I want to point out that skills are based on values. Um, uh, and we can't get away from that. Values decide what kind of skills you're going to learn, which skills that are good. I mean, you can be a good soldier, and that's a skill, but it's, it's different value. So we have to really look at the values of any skill that we want to put out. You can't get away from it, because it's like the foundation of a house. And skills are just a, something that can be built off of those values, but it depends on the values of what the skills are, what they're useful. So I just wanted to make that clear that we cannot get away from values and every skill is based on some kind of value. Um, so uh, when we were looking at that comparison side by side of the different values, I feel frustrated because I, I've seen, and I know we're talking about co-optation and the capitalist hydra and how when you cut off one head, more heads come up. And I, I feel that so strongly with the nonprofit industrial complex, especially here in this city, which has been taken over by that. And it, they, I've seen, I've been in nonprofits where they take some of those values and they say these are our values, but then at their root, they're still the things on the right. And I just feel a lot, it's heavy on my heart. I feel a lot of frustration. Um, and even when you try to talk to people, I just don't know how to get to them to care sometimes because they're so hungry for community that they'll take that from nonprofits or whatever and not, and, and accept that the, the stuff on the right is what's really happening, but at least we can have some of these values and I just, I don't know how to talk to people. I don't know how we can combat that and I think that's a really important question to ask as we build our movement. Because the nonprofits, I feel like, get the narrative and, and they have good connections to the communities and stuff, so how do we, how do we deal with that? The, this, this woman's been waiting for so long. Um, excuse me, this person, I wanna assume people's gender. Um, so just, we'll hang tight. Um, thanks, y'all. I'll just say as a process point uh, for someone who's very nervous to talk in front of big groups of people, if at any point we want, like in these sessions, we can like turn to our neighbors and talk to each other, that would be supportive, I think, for more introverted people to be able to step forward and speak up. Um, but my, I appreciate the last two comments. Mine is somewhat related, which is, I find this conversation so valuable and so important and also very abstract. And when I've been part of many formations that come together and like, we need to get values and they spend a long time like really refining their values and creating value statements or articulating their values. And then 
when you're actually living in the world, values are contested, they're lived, they're complex, and there are ways that like everyone can align with a set of values on paper, but then in practice, a conflict arises that either pits values against each other or people's interpretations of values against each other. And like we, despite all this investment in, you know, thinking that we ha are aligned on values, it can actually, we actually end up with similar, like lack of politics or different politics, different ways of applying the values. And so I feel like it's almost like we constantly need, from my experience, we need to be like titrating in and out of like, yeah, let's align around our values, but then let's also live them and see how living them transforms how we relate to them and what they actually mean to us. And um, to think that we can like land somewhere that will then guide us feels, you know, incomplete, I guess, like land somewhere on a set of like ideological values that will then guide us. Yes, I want to answer that uh, as best, best I can. What I realize is that you can't talk about values without talking about practices. Uh, they're, they're directly related to each other. And if some people talk about values but they don't practice it, then they're not really understanding what values are. Or they're misunderstanding that their values that are putting out there could be still capitalist values. So that's why I, I have the chart, is to make clear the difference between two sets of values. You know, because then you can see by referring to it, this chart and it, as it develops, what values are important and what practices will come out of those. But if they're just, if you just talk about values by themselves, that's not enough. You have to connect it directly to not only other values, but connect it to how people practice these values, because that will really show you whether they're practicing values or not. Because, like I say, people can say. Talk about values, but then the, the values they pract the practice are not, they're not the same, they're different, or they're contradictory. So we, this is the idea of this, this workshop, so to speak, is to clarify how to deal with that aspect. You know, you, we, we can't just talk about values without talking about what comes from those values, the practice that comes from that. They used to say theory and practice, but it's the same thing. It's holistic, you know? It's, it can, it's abstract if you only talk about values and not about what those values, how they operate in the world. I just want to make that clear. Yeah, um, just to flag, we have about five more minutes. Um, I, I briefly want to respond to that, that question about um, nonprofits and, and the sort of like realm of acceptable change within, within capitalism and um, and how we're all kind of embroiled in that and trying to navigate that, especially like related to what like you know Wayne had to say earlier about survival, right? Like we're all trying to navigate like how do we how do we survive as individuals, as communities, as movements, you know, and also like that's the established way to do it, and we're being railroaded into it. I just want to kind of flag that as one of the issues and concerns that went into the formulation of this of this session, and I think is something that we're many of us right now are really really living, I just wanna echo how that really like hits home with me right now and, and my close comrades. Um, and then this gentleman over here. Yeah. And then I'll just go, maybe I'll squeeze through like on this side so I'm not, so I can see people still. Um, okay. If folks could keep their, con like we have five minutes, which means probably realistically like 10. Yeah. <laughs> All right, sounds good. I'll keep yeah, yeah, it. It's because yeah. we had a long conversation last night, so we knew I was going to be like, you know, 10 minutes. No, I'm just playing. Um, no, I'm just, I'm just teasing. Sorry. It, so one of the things that, like, I struggle with, like, I went through a pan-African phase in my life where, like, I was trying to reconnect to my African roots, and I was very much about, like, decolonizing my mind and, and doing all these different pieces. And then I remember reading Du Bois, and one of the things that he has shared is that, like, we can't necessarily romanticize the past, because one, there was issues with that as well, and then secondly, there's never a full return to that. Um, and even in the process of decolonizing my mind, like all of those problematic things and all those capitalist things, they still exist within me. And maybe I replace them with new values, but like those scars, those 
reactions in troubling times can like still come back. So I guess like my question and like the tension or the thing that I'm wrestling with is, do you just have thoughts on how we continue to combat those things and how we deal with the fact that there is no completely getting rid of these things within us in this generation, um, but sort of reckoning with the, uh, you know, the, the new self that we might be once we kind of incorporate these new values into us. I really have to answer that. Um, there's one aspect of this, what, what we're trying, which I haven't developed enough, but which I realize is really important and needs to be developed more is healing. Because we're all living under the trauma of capitalism. And it's a very nasty kind of trauma. It affects everything. You know, between people, between families, between groups, racism, uh, abuse, child abuse, spousal abuse, all of those come from our hurts that we direct against each other. And the only place that so far that I've found that really looks at that and tries to deal with it is a art re-evaluation uh, community, re-evaluation, uh, what's the last word? Re-evaluation, <laughs> I'm getting old, so. But anyway, we're, we're gonna try to, I'm gonna try, and I, with other people's help, to develop an, a part of that talking about healing. And because it, I, I was in the, in the RC community, and I, like somebody else pointed out, I hated white people. I had all this anger, I had all this sadness, all this humiliation living under this racist capitalist society that I was carrying around and was keeping me from doing what I really wanted to do. And when I was, I had a safe place to let go of all that hurt, and it made a tremendous difference in my life, not only with working with uh, white folks, but with my own family, because I was ignoring my own children to a large extent I had my nose they kept pointing out dad you always had your nose in the newspaper you know i was it was a good thing to learn to keep up with the thing with the, what's going on in the world but i also needed to learn about how to better relate to my own children to give them good attention and i remember my my uh, son nine years old he said dad are you still doing that rc stuff i said yeah he said good because <laughs> he noticed the difference in me so that's one thing i'm not saying it's the only thing but it's one of the, it's a worldwide movement started by an old communist in Seattle, but it evolved over time and I learned a lot from it. And it's one way that we can tap into for this healing process because we absolutely have to include healing in our new movement. Yeah, greetings. Um, you know, I, I'm. I appreciate that we're in a circle. You know, what I mean, because I think that like that in itself is like grounding us into a, a new paradigm. And you know, as I'm sitting here uh, listening to all these amazing human beings, and we're trying to like enter into this space more together. Um, I guess I want to like ask or maybe create an invitation that like like how how can we while we're here like kind of identify these values that we're sharing amongst each other and how to like take a step deeper into the circle while we're here, that we can practice it as a way that when we leave here, you know what I mean, we can have like that deeper connection that we're carrying to our various cities and things like that. So I'm guessing I, I'm, I'm asking for an invitation. If, we ha if there isn't already a space to go like deeper into what this will look like in practice, you know what I mean, to have that type of space. Yes, uh, my idea is that this needs to be developed to be, it has to keep evolving and it can't be done just by me or just me and her. It has to be done by all of us and all of us can, once we start clarifying our thinking and our values, we can jump in and add new values that would work well and have discussions around the country. If you wanna get started, you can uh, email, I think we have our email on the, the papers we passed around and invite both of us to come to your community or movement, and we will do this again. And then hopefully and over time, we will get more people involved that they will start doing it on their own and adding to it, or we could, you know, her, she, uh, she and I can continue to work and evolve our work together, and maybe we can have a, like a weekend session or even a week-long workshop, because this is so important. You know, we have to fix we have to be clear on the foundation of our new movement. You know, otherwise we will keep stumbling and making mistakes. So you, all of you can make sure that you take this 
home with you. You can go to uh, medium.com, which is our, this article is in that, Roberto Mendoza, medium.com, and a bunch of other articles, like when I talked about sovereignty and, and indigenous thinking and all those stuff. And we, we have to spread this around. We have to make, we have to, the idea is to get clear so we stop making these mistakes around values and practice. So let us know, you know, invite us to your group or your university or whatever, because these ideas, we cannot do it all by ourselves. We need your help. Oh. I um, yeah, I was, I was about to close, but um, okay. I think it's just a sign that this conversation is gonna continue for a long time, and I just am so grateful um, to be here with all of you. Thank you for your your patience, your work, your thought, your heart. Um, I'm really looking forward to the rest of this week. Uh, let's eat. <laughs> yeah, thank you.